How are you this morning? Good to see all of you here. Open with me, if you would, to John chapter 5. And we will take a look at this same passage we've been in here for a week or two. But let's, um, I'm going to read actually, starting in verse 1 all the way down through 16, 17. But we are only going to deal with really 17, 18. So, yeah, two verses. So, short sermon, huh? You wish. I have three pages. But that ought to be fun. But let's pray first, and then we will uh, take our two verses. Like I said, we're going to read the background so that everybody's on the same page. But let's pray. Father, you are a good and gracious God. And God, you are so loving and so kind to us. Father, even while we were sinners, you sent your son Jesus to pay for our sin. Even before that, you had a plan in your mind before the foundation of the world to reconcile those of us who you knew would fall. All of us who have sinned, those you have chosen to save, Father, we knew, or you knew, that you would save us, and you worked a plan to actually redeem us and to save us. And Father, we are grateful. And Father, we are grateful and thankful for the rewards and the, the promises you've given us, a new body, eternal life, time with you in heaven, a kingdom of righteousness to come. Father, we are, we are so thankful for all of the things that you have promised and that you are working. God, help us to bear up now in this time, while we live in the evil day of today. Help us to bear up and to put on the whole armor of God. Father, to live for you and to do what you've commanded. Help us to live lives that are obedient to you and submissive to you and to not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. Father, each one of us are guilty of sin. Each one of us are capable of great evil and great darkness. Father, help to restrain us. Reel us in and hedge about us and keep us by the power of your Holy Spirit from sinning against you. Father, help us to live and walk righteously. Show us what the blood of Jesus has done through the power of your Holy Spirit in our lives. And Father, do this work because it is your work through us. Father, we know we are sinners, but we are grateful for your grace. Father, I thank you for each one you've sent this morning. I praise you for their faithfulness and for their love. God, for their commitment to you and to your word. Help us, each one, to be faithful to the mission of the gospel. Father, show us how to go out here and convert this community we live in to Jesus, that they all might hear. And even those who won't turn and believe, at least they will have heard the truth of the gospel and they will have rejected it on their own. Father, help us to do this work. It is a great work and it is a hard work. And Father, we are weak. We are quite often uh, miserable people because of our own sin and our own weakness. But I pray that you would bolster this church, that you would bolster the people of God in this community and have us do your will. Father, bless this message. Help us to see the truth of your word here in John chapter 5. And give us great grace that we might understand. Give us wisdom that we might apply this and make this applicable to our daily lives. Father, again, we thank you and praise you. We ask that you'll bind our church together in unity. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. John chapter 5. Let's start in verse 1 and read the context. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water, then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made, made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an, affirm, an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already that he had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. 
The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Now that was just for background, just to catch up. We had a whole sermon on this subject matter. Jesus heals this man, and you know we debated over whether or not this man was sick from birth, or whether this man had done something in his life to cause the sickness, whatever it was, but he was a crippled man who couldn't walk. And so in this case, Jesus comes, and if you remember our sermon before and the, the conversation we had, he healed him without saying a single word. He just told him, get up and walk. Jesus had already done the work of healing. And we had seen that at the end of chapter 4, if you remember, when he went to Cana of Galilee and worked a second sign by healing a nobleman's child. So we've seen Jesus' power. He has all power. He has all ability to heal. But the crux of this situation and the thing that's going to lead to what we read next is Jesus did this on the Sabbath day. And again, just purely by accident, just random chance, the Sabbath happened to be that day when he healed, right? No. You know I don't believe in random chance. And when we're talking about the Word of God or Jesus, there's nothing called random chance. Randomness doesn't fit into the plan of God. God is working and he does the work that he does and he does it when he desires to do it. And he desired to heal on the Sabbath. And so Jesus set this situation up in the sovereignty of God. Let's keep reading, starting in verse 16, so we can see how this unfolds. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Now, do you see the situation? The situation is twofold. Jesus has committed, in their mind, two great sins. First sin is he did work, in their mind, on the Sabbath day. That's forbidden. And again, we're going to talk a great deal about that because it occurred to me that, you know, we talk about the Sabbath from time to time and we mention it in these various passages, but I've never taken the time, I think, to go through a few of the Old Testament passages about the Sabbath with you. So we're going to do that this morning so that you can have an understanding that the Sabbath is an important part of the Jewish belief system. It's an important part of the biblical belief system. And in fact, just from, from your own recollection, if you recall in the Ten Commandments, is the word Sabbath in there? You better believe it is. Honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, whatever way you want to say that. Yes, it is in the Ten Commandments, which, by the way, you all say you believe and keep. Except that one, right? But think about it. This is important. And so what they're saying to Jesus, you know, at least on, at face value, seems right, maybe. Now, it's not. We'll talk about it. But the second thing, if you'll notice, they had two grievances here. The second was, is Jesus called God his father? To the Jews, this is blasphemy. For a man to call his father God, or God, sorry, God his father. That's blasphemy. Because in doing so, when a man does that, what the man is saying is, I am equal to God. Did you notice that in the, in the text here? Look at the end of verse 18 making himself equal with God. Okay? So that's what, they're, that's what they heard. When Jesus said, my Father, referring to God, that's what they heard. They heard blasphemy. This is a man saying his Father is God, making himself equal to God. So understand, there are two 
infractions or grievances here that the Jews are addressing. And did you notice how serious this was? They weren't just mad. They weren't just mad. They sought to kill him. You ever sought to kill anybody? You, you ever been mad enough with somebody right in that moment that you're ready to pick up stones or sticks or guns or knives or whatever and end their life right then and there? Some of you are liars. All of us are liars, but you know what I mean. Some of us have definitely been that angry at periods of time or points in our life or had those thoughts run through our heads. And But here... They believe they're doing this on solid biblical ground. And again, they're missing some things, and that's what we're here to talk about. But don't let these seem like they're just worthless accusations, because they're not completely worthless accusations. If any other man other than Jesus would have said they are equal to God, they would have absolutely deserved death, because they have blasphemed the Almighty and they've made themselves equal with Him. Jesus isn't any other man, though. He's not a regular man. He is a man, but he isn't only a man. Jesus is the Son of God, and you, you know that. So think about these things as we talk about them. But we want to deal with this Sabbath understanding. So where did the Sabbath start in the Bible? Take your mind back to the earliest place in the Bible you can remember the Sabbath being dealt with. There's one place and one place only. The very creation of the world, if you remember the first seven days. So if you were to look back, you actually won't find it in Genesis chapter 1. You'll find it in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 1, it says this, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended His work which He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. The seventh day, or what came to later be called the Sabbath day, is the day of rest. And God instituted this during creation. That's the first thing you need to understand about the Sabbath. Is this implementation, just like marriage, we talk about marriage, it came about in the creation account when he created man and woman. It doesn't come about in the law. It's the same with the Sabbath. The law only emphasizes what God had already implemented. The Sabbath is not something that comes out of Jewish law. That's the first mistake Christians make is they try to say, well, we're, we're not under the law, so we don't have to keep the Sabbath. Well, hold on, because then you could make the same claim about marriage. Well, you don't need to be married because, you know, that's a law thing. No, that was implement, implemented at the creation. The Sabbath is implemented there, not in the law. So understand that even in the Christian church, we need to have a better conversation about honoring God's Sabbath day. And now I, I understand the New Testament records on this, and I'm not doing this today, by the way. It's not part of this sermon. I'm just giving you a blanket statement here. There are New Testament statements that say, you know, let no one judge you in a Sabbath day or a holy day or a feast or what's understood. I got it. And, but we still need to talk about it. Because just because someone can't judge you in it doesn't mean you don't need to honor God in the thing. Let's be very clear. But we can talk later about that specific issue. That's not for today's sermon. But the Sabbath rest was instituted at creation by God first, not in the law. Now, let's jump to the next place and the first place that the actual word Sabbath appears. That would be Exodus chapter 16. This is, this is at the point where God has given them manna to eat. They've left Egypt and they're wandering around in the wilderness, and they're hungry. God has given them manna to eat. Listen to what it says here. Verse, Exodus 16, starting in verse 23. Then he said to them, This is what the Lord, or Yahweh, has said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to Yahweh. Bake what you will bake today, and boil what you will boil, and lay up for yourselves all that remains to be kept until morning. So they laid it up till morning, as Moses commanded, and, did, and it did not stink, nor were there worm, any worms in it. Then Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath to Yahweh. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh, which is the Sabbath, 
there will be none. Now it happened that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather, but they found none. And Yahweh said to Moses, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for Yahweh has given you the Sabbath, therefore he gives you on the sixth day bread for two days. Let every man remain in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Do you see that? That God gave them provision enough on Friday, the sixth day, to cover both Friday and Saturday or the Sabbath's needs. But did you notice that their rebellious hearts, even knowing that, some of them went out on Saturday in any way and looked for the bread. And of course, God got angry with Moses and said, how long will you people refuse to do what I say and listen to my words? This is a really big deal because it, it really comes up in our lives as much as it did in the Jewish lives. Is Just because there's a command from God does not mean everybody's keeping it. But let me ask this question. Should everybody be keeping God's command? Should we be honoring the thing that God said? Okay, if that's the case, then you have to answer to God for your rebellion against His Word. And again, this is where I bring the application to us for a Sabbath day. And again, we'll have that conversation on another day about exactly how we might do this. But understand, God's intended design for you and I at its core, and so far we're able to see this in the two things we've seen so far, is that God has created one day a week out of the seven. There are six you should do your work, and there is a seventh day that you should rest on, you and I. And it's the same for the Jews in the Old Testament. It's the same for us today. God designed six days to do your work and one day for us to rest. This is the design. And... What God has said here to the Jews, and you may even find this in your own life if you look hard enough, God will provide enough for you on Friday that you don't have to work on Saturday. Have you ever asked yourself, and I know this isn't universally true anymore, but why do people get paid on Friday a lot of the time? You ever think about that? Well, first, it's the end of the work week. If the week started on Sunday and then ends on Friday, which is the sixth day of the week, that makes sense that payday would be on Friday. Now, I get that's not universal today. With all of our electronic stuff, these companies can deposit checks and things when they want. But it used to be you would work the full week and you would be paid. It's only in our modern day where we have these cycles of payment that may fall in different places. But that is the intended course of work. It's always been that way for all of history. All of world history, you'd work your week, and at the end of the week, you would be paid. Now, there are itinerant laborers and stuff that would be paid on a daily basis. I get that. But primarily, you would work a week and be paid for a week. And so understand that this is God's implementation. God started this. He did this very pattern. And we need to think about God working for an entire week, six days, doing all the creation that he does. And then for whatever reason, he stopped creating new stuff on the seventh day. Now, I have something else to say about that because the idea that God quit working altogether is ridiculous. And that's not what he... He didn't stop doing all the work that he does because he holds the heavens and the earth and everything that is together. He didn't stop that work. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Let me read you another passage because this is the one... I've referred to a couple of times now, but Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. Listen to this in the Ten Commandments passage. Exodus 20 is the Ten Commandments passage. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahweh your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So it's right there in the Ten Commandments. It's posted on the plaque on your walls if you have the Ten Commandments up there. 
It's right in front of your eyes. And this was also right in front of the eyes of the Jews. You need to understand when something like this is not only something that you hear, but it's something you live by, it becomes extremely important. Now the Jews, they did a lot with it, and I'm going to talk about that here in a few minutes. They did a lot more than what it requires. But I want you to understand that this is a legitimate thing. It is commanded by God. The Jews were told, and you'll see it in just a second, that they would be cut off or killed if they didn't keep it. You need to understand it's a very serious thing. So when they see something they believe is happening on the Sabbath, that it shouldn't happen on that day, they're not only upset, they're ready to execute the judgment that God's law has called for. That's the key here. Now listen to this. This is Exodus 31. I'm trying to take you on a little walk through the history and the understanding of the Sabbath without blasting you with every place that the word Sabbath appears in the Old Testament. Exodus 31, starting in verse 14. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For who, whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to Yahweh. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. You notice that? One of those covenants that God made between man and his people was to keep and honor the seventh day of rest and to keep it holy and not do any work on it. So again, this is important. And did you see how extreme the penalty is? So when they are ready to kill Jesus for, for committing what they believe is a crime on the Sabbath day, the penalty of the law was death. So they sought to kill him. You see how we're tying it together? They're not making it up. It, it isn't something that is, is allowable on the Sabbath in their minds to do what he did. Now again, we have a lot to talk about. But the Jews were not wrong for trying to uphold the Sabbath. They do. They are wrong about something. We, we will get to that. <laughs> Look at that. One page down. You guys, so thankful that I uh, didn't rant too long on the first page. That's where I always get stuck, on that first page. I'm just kidding. Let me read you something about the Sabbath, though, from TorahLive.com. Now, they didn't have this in the Old Testament. This is something we have access to. But I, I wanted to look into what the Jews actually say about the Sabbath. What developed surrounding the Sabbath in Judaism? And so here you go. From TorahLive.com, this is, this is actually part of a course that they give on how to learn the various parts of the Sabbath and what the restrictions and guidelines are. Here's what they say. If you want to become an expert in the laws of Shabbos, and that's, that's what they call it in English, you need to know the lingo. There are 39 malakas. I'm assuming that's Correct. It sounds very Spanish to me, but I'm assuming it's a Hebrew word. That are prohibited on Shabbat. And each one has subsidiaries that are also prohibited. So right there, just, just at face value, there are 39 categories of infractions, or, or actually what it means is there are 39 types of work that you are not allowed to do on the Sabbath. And each of the 39 then have subsidiary rules underneath of them that you're also not allowed to do. Then, and what you may not know about this is, then the rabbis added some extra guidelines on top of that to keep you from causing any infraction against the actual guidelines themselves. Does that make your head spin? This is true. You look it up yourself. This is what developed and is still in place in Judaism to this day. Now, I'm, I'm gonna, I, I thought this would be fun to do, so <laughs> I'm going to actually give you one of the examples. 
this is awesome. So you're not allowed to sow or plant on the Sabbath. So that's one of the 39 categories. Sowing, planting, you're not allowed to do it. So that should be good enough, but it's not. There are some guidelines here. So, and again, I'm not giving you everything. I'm just give, I'm showing you the silliness of how this goes. The derivative guidelines that come from the, the one of these, the, for instance, sowing or planting, derivatives that you also can't do, just to make sure you keep these guidelines, you can't dig a hole at all, period, that could be used for planting. You cannot dig a hole. In fact, they were so strict on this, you were not allowed to take a chair and drag it across a yard like grass because it would dig a hole with the legs of the chair. Because on the off chance that somebody had a seed and that seed was accidentally dropped into the hole, it would be planted and would violate the Sabbath. I'm not kidding. This is legitimate. Go, Like I said, go read this stuff. Learn about it. You can't dig a hole. You can't drop a seed. You're not even allowed, by the way, to drop a seed. Period. Don't pick up a seed and then drop it because you will be in violation of the Sabbath. You are not allowed to water any plants on that day. Ladies, your flowers are to die on the Sabbath. You're not allowed to pour water on any plants. Now, those are the derivative laws that are in place to keep you from committing the primary thing of not planting or sowing. So those are some of the derivatives that you're responsible for. And by the way, that's just a little hint of what's actually there. But then, on top of that, the rabbis had a few guidelines to make sure you didn't violate the derivatives or the actual law here. And so here's one of those rabbinic things that were taught. And, you know, walls that keep you from getting in to violate the actual thing. You cannot set a potted plant on the grass. You're not allowed. You cannot take your potted plant and actually just set that potted plant on the grass. That is a violation of the Sabbath in their mind. Why? Because that potted plant sitting on the grass could potentially derive nutrients from the soil underneath, causing the plant to grow better. A violation and considered work on the Sabbath. Now, I beg you, I am, I am pleading with you. Does the Bible say any of that nonsense? Do, do you believe in any way that God intended that to be the level of restriction? That type of rule set. Is that what God intended for this? Let, let, me, let me read this to you from Matthew chapter 23 because this and other types of things like it, Jesus made this statement to the Pharisees and the religious rulers. He, Matthew 23 verse 4. He says, for they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Meaning they're hypocrites. They put all these rules in place, but no one can keep this stuff. No one can actually do this. And the, even the people most vehement about you keeping this level of law and restriction, they don't follow it. Because you can't follow it. It's ridiculousness. If you were to carry a packet of seeds and that seed packet would somehow rip open and those seeds would fall to the ground, you could lose your life in violation to the system they have developed. And they would give no thought to how you felt about it or what actually happened or a case-by-case -case basis. You would just be executed because you violated these rules. That's not at all what Jesus said. That's not at all what the law said. And God does not intend for you to keep everything that man says is a restriction around what God said. What you and I are responsible for is keeping what God said to the letter. That's it. My opinion, my religious rules and guidelines, the Jews' religious rules and guidelines, your religious rules and guidelines, they don't mean anything. 
And it ought to stop. It should have stopped a long time ago with the Jews. But they still do this to this day. They still have these rules. I told you if, you, if you ever go to Israel and you're there on the Sabbath day, you will get a lot of nasty looks, if not words, if you drive in certain neighborhoods on the Sabbath. Even as a visitor, an outsider, you drive through a Jewish neighborhood in your car on the Sabbath day, be ready because they don't like it and they believe you're violating God's Sabbath. If you get into an elevator in a hotel on a Sabbath day, every button for every level will already be pre-pressed for you. It will stop at every level so that you don't so much as lift a finger to push room or, you know, floor 12. Literally. This is how far this has gone. They had other restrictions and rules like... Um, you could lift something on the Sabbath, but you were not allowed to lift it above your shoulders. You could lift it, but not above your shoulders. Anything lifted above the shoulders was considered work and a violation. But you could lift it to here. Isn't that ridiculous? Do you think this is at all what God had intended? No. Now I'm going to read it to you in a little while, but I'll just say it here. The seventh day or the Sabbath was made for man and not the other way around. Man was not made to, to keep you know, this huge set of restrictions against him. The Sabbath was designed for men to re rest and to relax from the work that they do. This is God's intention for the Sabbath. And, and I'll read you that right out of the Bible here in just a little bit. But the intended design was to provide a day where a man could take a break from his normal routine of working and, and constantly going after it for his livelihood. So you have to understand here, a lot of our lives are spent working for our homes, our families, our food. Think about your life, the general course of your life. You know, whatever your schedule is, and it, I know it's different today because of three shifts and all these things, but just think, you're working some portion of every day just to feed yourself and provide for yourself, and put a roof over your head, and feed your family, and put a roof over their head. The intention is, is that you would do those things for six days a week, and then you would stop doing them for one day a week. And you would get some rest. You'd get some relief. You'd get, a, you'd get time to finally wind down. We all know we need this. We, we all know it's unhealthy for us to work seven days a week, seven days a week, seven days a week, seven days a week. Nobody wants to keep doing that. Nobody can Keep doing that. Anytime you've ever done that in your life, and, and I've been guilty of doing this myself sometimes, but anytime you've ever done it, you're so worn out. During the process, after the process, you become almost unbearable to live with. The amount of sin and the amount of, you know, just chaos and depression and frustration in your life is enormous because we won't stop. This is the Sabbath that God designed for you and I. It isn't something that is supposed to be a burden. It's something that's supposed to relieve you from your burden. And this is, this is what Jesus deals with many times in the Gospels. I mean, this issue comes up more than once in the Gospels. God loves us, and He wants us to live a healthy life. Not an unhappy, frustrated, painful life. Because we won't stop and we won't let, let our lives wind down for a minute. Let our minds just relax. Have, have, you ever, have you ever worked so hard for a period of time and when you sat in that chair or on that couch or you laid down in that bed or whatever you did, the relief and, and, just, and, and you knew you had some hours, whether that was an evening or the next day or whatever, but you had some freedom. You had some hours. Have you ever realized and noticed the stress and the relief in your mind that just, it just fades away? Even if some things are still open that you need to do later, if, you, if you're letting them go for right now and you're going to put them off for a day or so so that you can re relax and reflect and, and catch up and recover, you ever, you ever feel how that feels? 
it, it, it's like a rush of endorphins. I, I don't know about you, but sometimes when, I, when I've gone through a really tough week, man, when I get to Friday and I know I'm going to have the weekend to, to do some stuff, to you know, kind of get away from work and relax, it, I, it is tremendous. Sometimes I just collapse. And maybe it's just I get to fall asleep in my chair on Friday night. I'm telling you, this past week has been like that. I work, you know, I started a new job recently. Think about that. So we all know how it is to start a new job. You're trying to learn everything. You're trying to get to know everybody. You're trying to do well and not mess it up and get fired on the first week or two. So there's a lot of pressure there. But then every evening this week, I've had other things, ministry-related things that I've been doing too. So when I got to Friday, I am not kidding you. We had a birthday party over here. But at the birthday party, I pretty much just sat there and talked to people. I, it wasn't my party. I was just, you know, it was there for my grandson's party. And then when I went home, I was able just to relax. Yesterday I was able to relax. That is a great feeling when you have the time to just relax. That's what God's intended for the Sabbath. That's what he wants for you and I. He gave you one day a week to do that. And, and you know what keeps getting in the way of us enjoying that and, and having that be that special, relieving, relaxing, and restful time? Us. Us. We keep getting in the way of it. Oh. Yeah. Well, I think that I think you get the full fullness of the understanding there. But verse 17 makes it clear that God does not stop working entirely on the Sabbath. This, this is another aspect of this that, you know, we have to deal with it. If you look at what Jesus says here in verse 17, but Jesus answered them. My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Meaning that God doesn't stop working on the Sabbath entirely. He does not do certain things. You notice he's not creating worlds. He's not creating people. He's not creating stuff. But what is he still doing? Well, just like I hinted at a little while ago, he's holding the entire universe together. The, the planets are still orbiting. The sun is still doing what it does. All of the things of nature, the rain is falling, the animals are still getting their food, you're still getting your food, God is providing you shelter and sunlight. God is still holding everything together, so there is still work to be done. And you'll notice Jesus, who is not a sinner, by the way, and never commits any sin, he healed this man on the Sabbath. In another passage that I'm going to read to you, listen, listen to this, Matthew 12, verses 1 through 8. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain to, and to eat. So technically, what they're doing is harvesting grain and eating it. You're not supposed to harvest. You're not supposed to prepare food. But they're taking the food and they're eating it. Now, Jesus is there with them. He's doing this too, apparently. And this is on the Sabbath. But you notice there's no infraction. Listen to verse 2. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him. How he entered the house of God. He's talking about the temple. And ate the showbread. Or not the temple, sorry, the tabernacle. And ate the, and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. See that? Not only were his disciples plucking grain and eating it, but David and his men, when they were fleeing from Saul, they were hungry and starving. They went into the temple, took the showbread, which is on the table over here, and they took the showbread, which is supposed to be meals and food for the priests, by law, they ate it. And they were not guilty before God for doing so. Verse 5, or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? You see that? Think about this. On the Sabbath day, there are still priests who go into the temple. They trim the lamps on the, on the, on the menorah over here. They bake the showbread to put out on the table as an offering. They if it's on a particular day, they offer incense on the golden altar in the back. They still do work. They still do service in the temple of God 
on the Sabbath day. And guess what? They're not blameless. They're, they're not blamed. They're still blameless. Yet I say to you, verse 6, that in this place there is one greater than the temple. Now who is he talking about? Himself. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would, have not, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. This is an important concept for you to understand. And really, I'm going to boil this all down for time's sake. But really what Jesus is saying in all of these passages and in all of these statements He's making back to them is, it is never wrong to do good on the Sabbath. Ever. There are other instances that we're not going to read this morning where an animal falls into a pit and on the Sabbath they go and they get their animal out of the pit. That would be work. And in fact, they would have to lift quite heavy stuff to get an animal like an ox out of a pit. But they do that so the animal doesn't kill itself trying to get out or injure itself. That's on the Sabbath. It's work. But nobody's blaming them for getting their animal out who would die otherwise. See, it's never wrong to do good on the Sabbath. It's never been wrong before God to do something good. The type of work that God wants you to keep from is the type where you're doing regular normal labor to feed yourself and to pay for your house and to buy yourself stuff. The stuff that works for your well-being. What God wants you to do is to do good. He wants you to rest on the Sabbath. But if you have to do something, it better be something that's helpful and honorable and good. It better be a form of help, righteousness, you know, healing a man. Are you really going to blame Jesus for healing a man on the Sabbath and call him, say that he sinned and committed sin for healing a man on the Sabbath? No way. No way. This is the point. We ought to... We ought to, because God does, desire mercy rather than sacrifice. That's a proverb from the Old Testament. You should desire mercy rather than sacrifice. When you see someone being helped, you should never run up and say, oh, you did this and that was wrong and you were, this is the wrong day to do that kind of thing. What you should have said is, oh, isn't that wonderful, that man was healed. See, your heart is involved in this. And the Jews' hearts were involved in this. And Jesus is telling them, your heart is wrong. Jesus didn't sin. Jesus has never sinned. All right, let's deal with the second thing that they were upset about. Jesus said that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. Now, we've spent a lot of time talking about who Jesus is. This is I mentioned this to the Sunday school class earlier. Uh, on Wednesday night, we had a great Bible study talking about the preeminence of Jesus above everything. He's before all of it. He's above all of it. Here in John, just back in chapter 1, we learn that Jesus was with God, but He also was God. Jesus is the very eternal Son of God and the Creator of everything. See, this is the part that the Jews didn't get. They didn't believe. Jesus would make statements, and He would tell them, and they wouldn't believe it. This is the problem with people. This is the problem with us many times, is we won't believe God and what He says. The Jews thought He was committing blasphemy, but what, who they were really talking to was their very Creator. Can you imagine standing before your Creator and accusing Him of blasphemy? I, I want you to think about that for a minute. On any level, how does this make sense? You would stand before Jesus, the very Creator, the One who formed you, the one who planned to form you and made you breathe breath into your life, gave you all that you have, set you on the path and the course you're on, and you stand before him and say, you're committing blasphemy. It's ridiculous. Now I get they didn't understand who he was, but you need to go back and read through this passage a little bit in some of the Gospels. Jesus was telling them who he was. They knew for sure he was the Messiah based on the things he was doing. He could heal the blind. No one could do that but the Messiah. And if you would go and pin and tie everything together in the Old Testament, you'd see that the Messiah is the Son of God. He's the Eternal One. 
this is the thing. He uses that word son of man so that we would go back to Daniel. Daniel chapter 7, do you remember? Where the son of man comes with the clouds before the ancient of days. Do you remember that? You've got God the Father and the Son right there together, separate being, but both together. And guess what? That Son riding on the cloud, I like to call Him the cloud rider. That Son riding on the cloud, He is given a kingdom that is an eternal kingdom that will never end. It will never pass away. The Jews knew all of this, or they should have, but they refused to believe. Let, let me read you another passage from, this is a little bit later in John, and in a couple years we'll probably get to chapter 10. So, I figure it won't hurt us to read this now. This is from John chapter 10, starting in verse 24. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? <laughs> Listen to this. If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. He goes through so many conversations trying to tell them and show them who he is. All of these works and miracles and healings and things that he can do. And they still don't get it. So they say they just say it outright. All right, buddy, tell us who you are for real. Are you the Messiah or not? They just lay it out. Okay. Verse 25. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe, because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Can you imagine what that made them do? <laughs> then the Jews, just this, I mean, it, it tells us immediately. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Notice that. Again. This is not the first time they've tried to stone Jesus. I mean, we're reading back here in chapter 5, they tried to kill him. Here in chapter 10, they're picking up stones for at least the second time. Who knows? Verse 32, Jesus answered them, Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him saying, listen to their hearts here. For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself God. You see that? That's in John 10. This is where they are. Jesus did tell them. Jesus did show them. Jesus has shown them so much that it should... If you and I could imagine for a moment being in Jerusalem while Jesus healed basically everybody who came to him. He went and, and healed special people in certain places, including blind people, lame people, deaf people, people who are completely crippled and can't walk. He doesn't just say, you'll be, get well later. No, on the spot, he takes away whatever their thing is. Whatever infirmity or disability they have, he removes it in an instant. Without a word in many cases. Just get up and walk. And they won't believe. So if your heart is there where God can tell you over and over, and again, he's telling you from his word, he's telling you from the other believers who share his word with you, and if he can show you over and over that his power, look at the world around you. Look at all of the miracles that he's done in the lives of the people you know. Think about all the miracles you've known that God has done. If you still refuse to believe, what more could God do? What more could he do? And this is the case with the Jews. He said it. He's shown it. What else do they want from him? And to end all of this, very simply, the same way that the Jews should have thought about this, even though they really didn't. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is God. Jesus is the eternal Son of God, the Creator. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. We saw that here. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. I guarantee you that God will never curse you or, or bring pain or judgment on you for doing good on the Sabbath. 
Where he may punish you is when you want to keep running over his Sabbaths because you want to work an extra day and make an extra day's wage. Or you want to make a little extra money so you could take that trip so you'll just work all the Saturdays from here to, you know, eternity. And that's where you might get into some trouble with God because you've refused to look at the day of rest that he's given you to relax and recuperate and catch up on, you know, private time, family time. The Jews turn the Sabbath into a great family time much of the time. This is one of the aspects of Judaism I think is good. Not all the extra restrictions, but the family part of it and the part where you focus on the Lord. I think I told you one time that, I, that Alistair Begg said when he was a kid in Scotland that on, on now it was on Sunday in his case, but because again, a lot of the church for a lot of years have moved the Sabbath to Sunday. It's not, but anyway, just understand what I'm saying. They would celebrate it on Sunday after church. And they'd go to the family's house or something, and if he started talking about his toys or some goofy stuff that he, that he was into during the week, his grandfather or his dad or someone would say, we don't talk about that stuff on the Sabbath. If you don't have something to say spiritual or, or holy or godly or good, then just leave it for another day. See? This stuff has been done in the church too, sometimes. But we need to get better about this. The Jews need to recognize who the Messiah is. And if you're sitting out here and you don't recognize who Jesus is, you need to recognize who. He's the very Savior. He's the eternal Son of God. He is the one who shed His blood on the cross to pay for all the sin of all those who will ever believe. Once for all, according to the book of Hebrews. Once for all, He died, shedding His blood. So if you will ever believe, He covered your blood on that cross. He covered your sin, sorry, with His blood on that cross. You need to trust Jesus, and you need to follow Him. And part of doing that is, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. That means you'll be obedient to Him. You won't live for you. You won't make up the rules as you go along. You won't put the restrictions in that you want to add. You'll just point people to the Bible and say, this is how I live, and this is how you should live. And that's the mandate for each one of us. The Sabbath is a great thing if it's used in a godly way. It's a terrible thing when it's used as a hammer against people. And a lot of us, I think, are misusing it or abusing it in our own lives. And we're reaping the reward of that, all of the stress all of the pain and all of the turmoil and uh, maybe the, the tiredness. We're all reaping that if we're not honoring God's Sabbath. I'm not judging you, but I, I am telling you that God gave it to you for your benefit and my benefit. So you ought to think about it and reflect on it. Trust Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful for your word and for your love for us. I know, Father, we all uh, sin and rebel in many ways. God, I'm asking that you'll help us see the areas where we individually are not living up to your word and we're not holding it in the regard we should. God, show us these, these pain points and these errors so that we can fix it and we can walk closely with you and in holiness. Father, help each person here to evaluate their life before you, whether they've trusted your son Jesus and are obedient to him, or whether they haven't. God, do the work in their hearts that only you can do. Transform and change the hearts of stone that are still here amongst us. God, we wait on you to do the work, and we pray that you would use us according to your purposes, and we would love to see where your, where your will takes us and what you'll do with this ministry. You are an amazing God. We long for the kingdom to come, the kingdom of righteousness. Father, bless us while we wait and use us according to your purpose. Father, thank you. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. You'll stand with us as we sing our last song, Onward, Christian Soldier.